The biggest question I get out when I do outreach is, do California native plants make flowers? Yes, they make flowers like any other plants from any other part of the world. That's how they make more of themselves. So right now we're in a section of the nursery that has a lot of the plants that grow in the dry shade of large trees. So here we have native gooseberry, then we have snowberry and barberry and all different types of um, evergreen and uh, other types of native plants that lose their leaves in the summer. So you just have to choose what kind of look you would like. If, if you'd like something like um, the barberry here that's evergreen, um, or we have the carpenteria. This is a beautiful plant that makes big white flowers that look like camellias. Um, and then all on this other side, we have native gooseberries. So there's the golden currant, and uh, which is a plant that flowers with big yellow flowers that, that hummingbirds love. And then when they're pollinated, they make golden currants. Great for kids too, and adults. So there's, I mean, as you can see, there is a huge number of plants to, to choose from, and they're all meant to grow in the shade of large trees, the dry shade. Well, let's go into the sunnier part of the garden and take a look at what's available there. Okay. All right. Ah, good. All right, so the one thing that California does not have a lot of naturally are vines. Um, we do have our own native grape. We have a native honeysuckle and a uh, clematis. So the grape loses its leaves in, in the winter, but the honeysuckle is evergreen. So um, with the grape, you get fall color of yellow or, or red leaves and then grapes for people um, in the spring and summer. And it's great for, for wildlife. Then as we walk down this way, we're getting more into the native grasses. And then the desert section is, follow, is down there past Charles. And then beyond Charles and the desert section is the riparian section. If you don't want to use plants that use um, a lot of water, don't go to the riparian section because those are plants that evolved in California along streams. If you do have a part of your yard where water happens to, to pool or where there's a, a natural seep or a natural wet place, then go to the riparian section of our nursery because that will ha those, will have the, those will be the plants that will grow naturally in that wet place in your yard and be perfectly adapted to it. This nursery does go on and on and on and on. And this is just a small section of the mm -hmm. nursery. There's still the other side of the road and then the front part of the um, land as well. And then again, there's so much that's planted for you to just watch and see what they can look like when they're in full grown um, at maturity. Why don't we go over to the tree yard now? Because um, there are lots of beautiful small trees over there. Here in this aisle, we have just a small sampling of California's many type of manzanitas. These make bunches of white flowers in the winter and spring that the hummingbirds need for their food for their babies. Hummingbird babies are too small to eat a caterpillar. So the hummingbird parents feed their babies the small insects that, that live in the manzanita flowers. And here's a beautiful fact about coevolution of hummingbirds with the manzanita. The manzanita blooms exactly at the time that hummingbirds nest. So if you want to really support hummingbirds with the nectar for the adults that's full of the protein and the amino acids and minerals that they need, plant a manzanita. Don't feed them the sugar water that so many people are, are doing. That's like feeding the birds soda pop. So here we have Nevin's barberry. And this is a marvelous plant to be a barrier shrub. It gets about eight feet by eight feet and it makes bright yellow flowers in the spring. But the reason why it's a great barrier shrub is that it's evergreen and it has these really prickly leaves that um, will keep anybody from spray painting your wall or being able to climb your, your fence. You do not want to mess with these leaves. Then furthermore, 
Um, when this plant um, gets big and bushy, it's an excellent plant for nesting for birds because it's too prickly for cats to climb in there and get any of the babies. So Lisa, where are we at now? We're in the tree yard and we have about 35 different types of trees in our tree yard uh, from week to week. And to check our nursery inventory, you'd go on to the Theodore Payne Foundation website, which is theodorepayne.org. And then you'd go to the nursery inventory. And then you see the plant types and the sizes and the quantities that we have every week. So here in the tree yard, my favorite trees are the Western Redbud, the Blue Elderberry, Coast Live Oak, California Bay Laurel and the Santa Cruz Island Ironwood. Those are my those are my top five. Well, let's take a look at a few of those. I know this is one of your favorites, then. Right. And if you can explain why it's it's one of your favorite trees. Well, I I love the Western Sycamore because, well, for a variety of reasons, but its leaves are food for the Western tiger swallowtails, and their their caterpillars eat the leaves of the sycamores plus four other types of California native trees. Then on the underside of the leaves, there's this very soft fuzz. And that's what the hummingbirds' parents pluck from the underside of the leaves and mix it with clean spider webs to make their nests out of. So if you have a manzanita and a sycamore in your garden, those two things are prime hummingbird habitat. That's really remarkable. What else can you show us here? Um, here we have Western redbud. This is a beautiful small tree for a garden. It gets about 15 feet high, 12 feet wide. Masses of magenta blossoms every spring. It loses its leaves in the winter for about three months and then you get this beautiful um, heart-shaped green leaf all summer long. And then when the flowers are pollinated, beautiful uh, russet color pods of seeds for birds. Wonderful. Then my other favorite tree is a, western, is a blue elderberry. And this is a tree that will need to be pruned on average uh, once a year. It grows really fast um, and so therefore makes a lot of dead wood. But it is a butterfly magnet all spring and summer with giant clumps of, elderbe of elderberry flowers. And then when those flowers are pollinated, giant clumps of elderberries for birds and other animals. So when my kids were little, they used to um, make sort of a, a nest underneath the branches of the elderberry in our backyard because I, I let the branches sort of grow down toward the ground. And it was this shady place where you could sit on, underneath the canopy and look up and see birds in the canopy and all kinds of butterflies. Wow. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful tree for wildlife value. But it's not a huge tree as well. I know some of these trees can grow 30, 40, 50 feet. This right. seems to be about a 10 foot. Actually, it's more like about 20 to 25 feet oh, high so and, and wide. And many people prune it into a, a standard uh, type of sh shape with just a single trunk. But I like mine where it's multi-trunked and forming a big mushroom kind of canopy. Well, it's healthier that way too because shading the tree trunk and right. preventing the tree from tree burn. Right. Um, so that is a great way to actually grow a lot of your plants and trees. Yeah. Um, I noticed over here is actually one of my favorites and it's just amazing to be able to hold one of these little yeah. babies. But this yeah. here is the Coast Live Oak we were standing under just a few minutes ago. And it's just remarkable that this thing here is going to support over or about 5,000 yeah. species that are native to this area that depend upon this one tree, the Coast Live Oak. What a remarkable plant. And oaks grow really fast. I often hear people say, oh, I don't want to plant an oak. It takes forever for that tree to grow. Well, no, actually, in the first 10 years, oaks grow incredibly fast because they're trying to get up and out of range of hungry deer mouths. So I have a baby oak that I planted at not much larger than this size in my yard three years ago, and it's now about 12 by 12 wow. feet. And that's from this size. So, you know, you, you can have a good sized tree in, in 10 years, and it's better to plant from a small size because that way the plant roots are going to get best established. So come and get your trees. What else do you want to show us in this garden? Let's go to the Santa Cruz Island Ironwood. So here, 
This is a beautiful tree that used to be all over the state of California, but then at the end of the ice age, the tree retreated to the, to the islands off our coast. And so now, naturally found in, in the wild, it's um, just on Santa Cruz Island and I think maybe one or two other islands. It's an evergreen tree that makes this beautiful filtered shade year round. It grows very fast, about um, on average three feet per year. And it has this beautiful red shredded bark and then the leaf drop is sort of these lacy russet brown leaves so it makes a beautiful mulch with the leaf drop and then you have evergreen fern like leaves year round and this this one grows to be about 30 to 35 feet tall and about 15 feet wide it would make a beautiful copse of trees if, if you planted say three of them in an in an arc as a focal point in a backyard and then had a bench right in in the middle of them well, I see a lot of plants over there on that side of the garden, and that's where I picked up my plants that I brought into my garden. And let's go take a look at that one last area before we conclude. Okay, that sounds great.